welcome friends to this monthly get together that we have here and as i explained earlier the idea of having a monthly meeting is to keep our minds on track on a spiritual path our minds being what they are and the distractions of the world today and we are easily carried away by those distractions and it is a good thing to get together once a while in order to remember the main purpose of human life this is a question which has been asked for a long time what is the purpose of human life in fact what is the purpose of life itself life exists in many forms we found these beautiful flowers they come from living plants trees are growing outside insects are going round there is life all over this planet somebody said in the sahara desert there may be no life because all sand but a man took a person and dug a little bit of the sand and little insect crawled out of that there is life all over apart from that there is life in very small forms like bacteria which is full of their own universes in each one of us we have so much bacteria each one is a living soul so if you consider what is life life is all over and what is the purpose of all this life here the purpose apparently is to express itself to express its creativity that there is a power that can create life and life can form itself into beauty as in beautiful flowers beauty of the landscape beauty beautiful faces of people that beauty expresses itself beauty expresses itself and the appreciation of beauty leads to joy and bliss apparently the source of all this was a source of bliss and joy and that is why it appears we have come from a source which was full of joy and bliss i am afraid my voice is not too good today because of a little throat problem i have had for a while but i hope you will be able to understand me now this life is in many forms according to a list compiled by the ancient indians they say there is 8.4 million churasi lakh types of life forms of life species of life more than half of it is in the plant kingdom and a lot of it is in the kingdom of small very small insects as very small life forms the human form is unique amongst those 8.4 forms because this is the only form in which a person says what is my purpose of being here no other life form questions what is the purpose of being here their purpose is expressed by itself by living their very existence is the expression of the purpose of why they are here they expressing their inner creativity they expressing their beauty expressing the joy of being able to grow being able to be alive and be something very different from things that are not living like rock or sand when we think of the creative power of life we go back to what is making it a creative power after all when we want to know what is life how do we know what is life we come to know only through our perceptions as a big thing that if we do not have our sense perceptions we would have no knowledge of any life or anything else our sense perceptions are giving us information about life and life is expressing itself without any concern what its purpose is human beings are unique in this whole 8.4 million species of life because they question what is our purpose why are we here the reason for that is that the human life is totally different from any other life and when i say any other life 
I am including life of angels who are living in a higher state of higher dimension, higher state of being, in a state of atmosphere which is higher than the physical atmosphere, in so-called astral and causal atmosphere. They life there, but there none of them is questioning what is the purpose of life. Only one being, a human being, sitting in the physical universe is asking, what is the purpose? Why am I here? The reason for this is that the purpose of this unique life was to rediscover our own origin, where we come from. And when we discover our own origin, we discover that we are not living here in our true state, in our true home, that we are far away from it. And our purpose of life is to go back to our true home. This is revealed in many ways. People, philosophers have tried to discuss free will. Why do we have free will? Do we have free will or not? Free will is one of the unique things that makes one ask this question. What is the purpose of life? So if we did not have free will, we would not even ask this question. Free will means that we are not sure that there is more than one answer to our questions. If there was only one answer, there would be no free will. And there's more than one answer, then there's free will. We have to choose between those answers. And that is why when we are here in the physical world, the question comes up, what is the purpose of life? Was it merely to come enjoy a short time here from birth to death? And then at the end of the show, or is there something more? When this question comes up, many other considerations come up with it. Are we happy here? Is this a place where our creative sense, our ability to be alive, our being alive here, has it given us happiness or unhappiness? Has it given us that which we believe is our original sense of creativity, which was bliss and enjoyment, appreciation, and love and appreciation of beauty, which was which is there all over the world, which is all over existence. Was that the only purpose that we should just appreciate it for a short while and be done with it? What happens before we are born? What happens after we die? <coughs> These are all questions which have been left to us to ask because we do not have much recollection of what happens before we are born. Is this body of ours the only reality? Is this brain of ours responsible for our consciousness? And does the brain function only during our physical life and there is no, no value after we die? These are all questions that come up providing us alternative answers, that maybe this is it. Socrates, the great Greek philosopher, who used to say that there is more than what we can see here, for his views on reality, that there is more reality than we can see here, he was condemned to death, he was sentenced to death, and was given hemlock poison to drink. And the tribune, the tribunal that sentenced him to death, they heard his last speech before he died. In that last speech, he gives a very good explanation in his own speech. He says, there are many possibilities. It's quite possible that by your sentencing me to death, you are ending my phase of unhappiness in this world. Thank you very much. If you are leading me to something, a greater discovery that I will find after my death, Thank you very much. So we're thanking the tribunal for the, all the possibilities that exist. And he examined all the possibilities that can exist when we die in the human body. But there are so many other experimenters asking the same question and experimenting with it who have said that there is a possibility to find out while we are living in this physical body, to find out what could possibly happen if we die? Would we really be dead or would something else happen to make us alive in some other form? 
some of the great mystics made this realization by pretending to die. Raman Maharishi, a great Rishi of India, he got his discovery merely by pretending to die. He was very sick, almost dying, and he had a servant attendant with him. The attendant had gone out at that time, and Raman Maharishi said, if I die, nobody is there to take care of me. And then he questioned, but what will happen if I die? So he pretended that he was dead. He stretched his body. He said, it'll be rigor mortis will take place. I'll stop breathing. He stopped breathing. And he said, but I can still think so clearly. I can still talk and ask this question still. Death doesn't seem to affect that power of my thought, of my thoughts. Power of my thinking and my questioning has not gone anywhere. And that was the beginning of his search for the truth of what happens after we die. And so many experimenters have done this. It need not be merely pretending to die. It is possible by experimentation to actually have the experience of dying while living. Many people have had that experience. If you have that experience of actually having the same experience of the human body dying while you're still living, you can know what will happen after you physically die. That is why they say that dying while you are living and you will live forever. That a death that takes place of the physical body does not mean that you really die. Now if you don't really die, where do you go? Where do you come from? There is a form within ourselves which awakens when this body dies. That form is what is providing our sense perceptions. Medical evidence says the sense perceptions are arising because of our body sense systems, our nervous system and the brain and the spinal cord is connecting it with all the perceptions. But recent researches are showing and a number of them coming up now which show that near-death experiences of which there is a large number of evidence now that they show that the perceptions still continue even when the body is physically dead, even when the complete death, all the signs of death that are known to us take place, the sense perceptions can still continue. Also, some other sense perceptions awaken. For example, it has been reported in many cases that a person can see the doctor attending on the body where it is dying and can see from a little distance from where the body is, very often from above the body. There's, there are experiences of many people very similar, which are uh, showing that the sense perceptions can continue even after the physical body and the brain are dead. And they can be revived, very few cases are there of revival, but where they have been revived, they say that the sense perceptions have continued. If we can, by experimentation, die while living, that means have the exact experience of dying while we are still living in the physical body and then be back in the physical body normally, we can have an idea what happens exactly. This is where meditation came into being to start with to get a higher knowledge of our being other than merely our physical body and to understand exactly how the sense perceptions work. If we meditate with our attention on our own self, wherever we think is our own self. Right now, if we want to know in this physical body where is our own self, it is known that it is operating from the head from the brain and to localize it more, you can say it is behind the eyes in the center. If we concentrate our attention on that center, which is the most common form of meditation upon our own self, if we withdraw our attention to our own self behind the eyes, we discover that we can become unaware of this physical body. It comes, the unawareness takes place exactly like when it happens when we physically die. 
I don't know how many people you have seen dying. I have seen many people dying in with terminal illnesses. And I know how when they die, they lose their awareness of their body in stages. They first don't know where their hands and feet have gone. Then they don't know where their legs and arms have gone. It appears to be withdrawal of awareness from the extremities of the body. And then ultimately the torso is lost from the bottom to the top. A man is still speaking, but he's unaware of the rest of the body. And only when, it, the, when we cross the awareness of the heart, the man cannot speak. And can still, the eyes are still moving and looking around, we can know it's living. And then when he dies, he's brain dead. So there is a certain order in which the awareness of the body goes away during physical death. And it appears that it's the same way that it goes away when we concentrate our attention on our own inner self behind the eyes. And our awareness goes away gradually from the extremities all right up to our own head. And then we don't know where our whole body has gone. But when that happens, we find our sense perceptions are completely intact. That we can see, we can touch, taste and smell exactly as we could do in the body. In fact, we find that these sense perceptions become sharper at that stage as if the body was a filter through which we could not use these sense perceptions fully. And now we can use them fully. Where are those sense perceptions? How do they survive even when we are totally unaware of our body? If we spend little more time in that state, we discover that those sense perceptions are also an inner self of ours, an inner body of ours. That body is called the astral body. It's not a body. The capacity to have sense perceptions is the astral body. And that is independent. It is working through the physical body. And therefore, since they are working together, we do not differentiate between the two when we are using our sense perceptions in the physical body. But when we are able to withdraw attention from the physical body and go into our astral self, we discover that the sense perceptions work independently and exist independently of the physical body. But that is not all. Our thinking mechanism, our brain that, that thinks now, keeps on thinking. There is no change at all in the process of thinking. We can keep on thinking the same thoughts, similar thoughts, even when we are completely unaware of our body. That's a great knowledge to know that the thinking process and the sense perceptions are not dependent on this body at all. And we can experience it. So that is why this kind of an experimentation that allows us to have these experiences of sense perception without physical body, to have the process of thinking without a physical body, they're very big experiences. Somebody suggested that these experiences can be generated in the brain, even through the physical body, and those who believe that the physical body is the only reality, they try to explain it that way, that the brain can design and work out similar experiences. But the brain cannot bring up something that happens when you are in that state. For example, in the sensory system, when you have the sensory body only, you start remembering things which existed prior to the birth of this physical body. And the brain cannot now make up something that you can remember something, remember an event, an actual event that happened somewhere where you existed without the physical body. And that event is remembered by you when you are only in the sensory system. That is why that sensory system has a longer life than this body has. And the other evidence also which comes up at that time to show that you were in that state even before you were born, and you will be in that state after you die. The time frame expands beyond this life, and that is how you know that you were in that form even earlier, and that the body was merely one small section of your life where you 
got into a physical body to have physical experience. Again, the same principle that life wants to show its creative power. Life wants to express itself. And this is how it expresses itself in the physical body by creating a physical experience. If we don't have a physical body, we don't have a physical world. It looks funny for me to say that because people assume the physical world is more real than our physical bodies. We were just born into this physical world and therefore the world has existed for millions of years and this body is just there for a hundred years or less. So how come that we are considering that there is no physical world unless we have a physical body? We have, whether a physical world exists or not, we do not experience a physical world without a physical body. A physical body encloses our sense perceptions and our thinking mechanism. It encloses in a physical form and therefore our contact with what is existing becomes physical. When we are not in the physical self, it becomes different. It becomes sensory and it expands. It becomes very different. People who have spent a lot of time in meditation and have had experiences of their astral self, they have seen that they can go much further because the astral self consisting only of sensory systems does not have any gravity, does not have any weight. It can fly anywhere. It can fly in what looks like a physical world. It can fly even outside. And that is why the experiences expand if you can stay longer in that state of being. Above that is the thinking process. Does the thinking process also end with the physical body or with the sense perceptions? Not at all. Thoughts go on even if we lose our sense perceptions. If we can withdraw attention from within the physical within the physical body to the astral, the sensory, and within the sensory, which is again a shape, a form, similar to this body, in the head of that sensory system, we find that we can also become unaware of the sensory systems. Thinking still goes on. That means the mind capacity to think is independent of the sens sensory system or of the physical system. All these can be verified by actual practice. And that practice is what we call real meditation to discover oneself. It has been said that the truth can be found if you find yourself. What truth? Truth means how this whole show has been set up. How this world is coming to be. Why are we, how are we experiencing all this? Are we experiencing because a world was created somehow, somewhere, and then we were placed in the middle to experience it? Or are we creating it because of these capacities we have been given of thinking and experiencing through senses and having a physical body to move around in what we are experiencing? What is the cause and what is the effect? Is a created world the cause and we are experiencing the effect or we are experiencing a world and that is how it is being created. The world has been created as a reality. It is real for us. We have no other definition of reality when we want to say what is real. We use our physical sense perceptions to determine reality. This is real. I just had a sip of water. It is real. I can hold the glass. I can touch it. Taste the water, it's real. My whole definition of reality is based upon the experiences I am having through my sense perceptions. And if, it, if the sense perceptions can create this reality elsewhere, I will think that is real. As it happens, we human beings have been given a very good device to find out whether it is reliable to use the sense perceptions to determine reality. And that is because we have the capacity to dream. We can go to sleep at night and have a dream. In the dream, we have the same sense perceptions. 
In the dream, we also see, we touch, taste, and smell. Now imagine if I have a dream, in the dream I am talking to you, and I was having a cup of water, and I would touch the glass, it would be exactly the same touch. I would have a sip and I would tell everybody, this is real because I can touch the glass, I can sip it, it tastes good. And then I wake up and discover that none of these things existed. But the experience existed. The experience of my touching the glass existed. But it was not real. It was real till I woke up. When I woke up, it became unreal. So it's very interesting that our whole method of defining reality is based upon a system. If we could wake up from that, it becomes unreal. So that is why if we can have a system of awakening, awakening from any state of being to a higher state, we could find whether we created that state dreamlike or it was really existing independent of us. When we do meditation of withdrawing our attention to ourselves, it is like awakening to a higher self. The awakening is not very different from withdrawing attention from one level of experience to another. When we awaken to the astral stage, we discover that what we thought was a reality was actually like a dream. This looks real because we are all judging each other from the sense perceptions being used at this time. Therefore, they are real. That's our definition of reality. When we wake up, that becomes real. This becomes unreal. Every night we go to sleep again, it does not mean because we have woken up and known the dream was not real, the next dream will not be real. When we go to sleep again, the second dream is also real. While we are dreaming. How come that when we already experienced that going to sleep and having a dream is not real, it's just a dream. How come when we sleep again, we still forget that the reality is not the dream but wakefulness? The reason is there is a complete cutoff of our awareness in the two stages. We think this body of ours which is having the experience is real. Therefore, the experience is real. When we go to sleep, we are unaware of this body. Because we are unaware of this body, a new body appears. And that looks like the only body we have. We are unaware of a physical body. The dream body is the only reality. We are judging the reality of the dream with the dream body, not with this body. And that is why it remains real when we wake up. The dream body and the dream both become unreal. Similarly, when we wake from the physical state to a higher state of being, then the physical body and the physical world all become a dreamlike thing. If we keep on waking up like this, how far can we keep on waking? Is there a limit? How, the, how many times we can wake up? People have had dreams, I have had dreams, where I dreamt within a dream also. I woke up, it was still a dream. But I thought I was now waking up from a dream and now I am awake. I awake second time, then I found the second wakefulness was also a dream. One can dream within a dream and have another, another within a dream. How often have we dreamt to create this physical experience of ours? If we wake up once to the astral plane and discover our sensory systems, our bodies are all light, running around, everything is lit up as a beautiful world, different world that was real and we are sleeping there and this body comes up. And when we awake, that body comes up. If we wake further, another body comes up which we call our thoughts or our, our mind. If we wake up from a mind, our soul comes up. We wake up from a soul, what comes up? How far does it go? Or is there no limit to it? Can we keep on awaking forever? The truth only comes to us when we wake up from the experience of a soul. What is a soul? Soul is consciousness. Soul is life. What makes us alive here is soul. And we don't discover this because life here can be defined with the concept of reality, with the 
whatever evidence we have here. When we have evidence at the higher planes, we define life from the experiences of that plane. But when we go above our mind, mind body, which is causal body, which has caused all the experiences in time and space, we cannot right here even explain what it is like to wake up from the mind. We wake up from the mind, we wake up into our soul. The soul does not live in time and space. The soul does not have any of the rules that we are having here. This creativity of the soul that is creating a mind and then it creates all the other levels of dreams which we call reality of different levels. But the soul also has an experience of multiplicity of souls. When the soul awakens to its own reality, it finds there is only one creative power. So one can say that this whole creation at all its levels are multiple dreams of one, only one ultimate reality. And we are that ultimate reality creating the many for the sake of expressing our creativity and the ability to have life and the bliss and joy that can come by the creative power at different levels. What happens at that stage? There are people who have attained that stage and we have their evidence. They, they are able to retain the memory of different levels at the same time, which we cannot do. We go to sleep and we cannot retain the memory of our wakeful state. If we do, it becomes a daydream. It's not a real dream. It does not become real. The only way a dream becomes real is if we completely forget our physical awareness, physical wakeful state. And that is why you cannot hold both awarenesses at the same time. But if you are able to reach that point of oneness, since the entire dream sequences are taking place within that oneness, at that time you can retain the awareness of every stage. When we say that some people have reached that level and we call them perfect living masters, that is how I would define my teacher, my Master by Sadhguru, whose picture you see here, Baba Savan Singh. I have sufficient faith and sufficient experience generated by following his methods to know that he was a perfect living master. What does it mean? Perfect living master means at this stage he was a human being with a white beard and a body like ours. He was born like us. He died like us. He lived like us. No difference whatsoever. But his awareness, what he was aware of was what he would be if he were sleeping, what he would be if he were awake, what he would be if he were in an astral stage, what he would be if he was in a causal stage, what he would be beyond the mind, what he would be in the state of oneness. All the awareness remains intact. Because this whole awareness arose from that oneness and it goes back to oneness, then it's a choice to reproduce this soul series of awarenesses or not. Therefore, this is the greatest miracle, the greatest wonder that I can possibly imagine that a human being sitting so far away with so many covers upon itself from that oneness can still attain that state of oneness in which the, all the levels of experiences that one can generate by successive dreamings can be kept intact in consciousness and can be shared at any level. It's a very amazing state to be in. The great master, as we called him, he was in a position to talk to people at whatever level they were. He could talk to us at physical level and he was taking care of people who were not in physical bodies. And he would talk to them at that level. They were in a different state of being. There were many of his disciples who had died, but had not stayed, 
have not gone to the state of oneness and they were at different levels and he would talk to them and deal with them just like he would deal with people at the physical level. So this capacity to be aware of all levels only comes at the top. And that is why there is a huge difference between a human being who has reached the top and anyone who has reached just below the top. That means a person who has gone beyond the mind and has attained the awareness of the soul, which is permanent. There is no time there, therefore it's permanent. Impermanence comes because of time. When there's no time, it's automatically eternal and permanent. People think of eternity as a stretch of time. You can keep on stretching time, it can't become eternal. You keep on stretching more. When there's no time and space, it becomes eternal automatically. So the soul is eternal and it's, it is not bound by time. It exists today, yesterday, tomorrow, at the same time. And that is why when we can get that experience of our own soul, it is like getting experience of true reality. Discovering your own soul is like discovering the truth. That this is the power and soul is consciousness and life. It is creating through that power. What is consciousness? Consciousness, the word consciousness has been used in different ways. But actually it implies that we can be aware of something, that we can be conscious of something. Consciousness generates the power to be conscious. Now does it have enough power to be conscious of something which doesn't exist and therefore make it exist? Yes, that is the real power. The real power of consciousness is that it can be conscious of something by its own power and what it becomes conscious of becomes creation. That's how creation has taken place. This whole creation is a game of consciousness. That consciousness could be conscious of anything without limitation, with no restriction at all. Total consciousness has no restriction whatsoever. Therefore, it can experiment with being conscious of anything. And whatever it decides to be conscious of becomes its creation. And that becomes simultaneously the creator of that and the experiencer of that. So that is the beauty. And our soul is consciousness. And that is why the discovery of our soul is a very big discovery of the truth of how this whole thing is happening. No questions are left. When one discovers one's soul, there's no question whatsoever left. All questions are answered right there. Because you discover how it's all happening. So that is why those people who have reached that level are also considered almost like perfect living masters. But they are just one step short of that oneness in which they hold all the levels in their awareness. So such people do guide us. They tell us how to meditate. There are masters teaching us how to go within our own self and discover higher realities. The reality is more real than the physical reality in which we are living now. Many masters can do that and they are doing it. Whatever level they reach, they think is the highest. And there is no problem in thinking like that because when we go to sleep and have a dream, we wake up, this is our reality. This is never a dream, this is real. We end here. We don't think there's anything more than that. If you go one step higher, that becomes the end we discover. We discover heavens and hells and we discover how everything is being prearranged over there. We discover our true nature is not the physical one, but it consists of sense perceptions existing without them. There's no way we can think there can be more than that. Each level looks like it is the last, it is the end. That is the real level we have come to. Every time we wake up, the level at which we wake up appears to be the only reality, the final reality. That is why the masters themselves, who reach the first stage, have thought that is our true home. And they call it our true home. And they have said we should go to heaven, because there is a heaven there. But to say, well, if there is a heaven, that means you are still in time and space. You are still in some limitation will not be understood by them. Because they will say, how can anything exist without time and space? They give so much credit to time and space. 
they say time and space is the creative power that is our true home so that is why the masters who go to different levels they think that is the end and their followers their students who are all students trying to find out the reality of their own selves they stick to that then how come there are masters who come from higher level how do they attract the people because those who are seeking a true home it all depends on what we are seeking if you are seeking our true home when we are with those masters after a while we discover that what we are getting is not what we are seeking it is a seeker the seeker determines if a seeker finds all he was wanting was a trip to heaven and a master gave him trip to heaven he is happy that's all he wanted that's all he was seeking a seeker who was seeking little blessing from a master so he can make some more money in this physical world and he make some more money he said thank you master that's what he is seeking a seeker, a seeker goes only to the extent of what he is seeking and therefore a seeker will go to the master and these masters will come into the life of a seeker depending upon his seeking if the seeking is more there will a master go the seeking continues then seeking continues then you find the next master who takes you higher there can be a series of masters not necessarily in one life it can be a series of lives in which we go through different masters and they take us to the point where they can take us they can't take us any more because that is their end they think it is their end they believe it and that is why they are very sincere about their description of the next level as the final level and but if our seeking is beyond that we do then come across a master who takes us beyond what determines where we will go which master will ultimately take us depends exactly on our seeking what we seek we find if we don't seek more we don't get more if we seek the highest we get the highest if we seek our true home of that oneness very few seekers are like that i must explain that this is not something very common most of us are seeking things for this physical world think it is the reality any better betterment we can get here is good enough somebody has got some special power can give us is good enough but some of us want to go far higher and find out the secret of life are we real here or are we have another existence higher than this they go higher but if we seek the ultimate if we seek the oneness from which the whole thing is originating we do a perfect living master will come into our life at the right time so several masters can come into our life into different lives of ours and bring us to the point where we get what we are seeking but the truth is now think of the strange paradox if the reality is only one how can there be a seeker outside of that one so if i say the seeker and the sought are the same at the end it is true here it is not true but at the end we discover that the whole process of seeking of a divided population of human beings sitting here is all coming from the seeking of the one so can it be called still seeking it is just an arrangement made by that one to discover rediscover itself when it wants so that is that the discovery that comes to us when we reach the final point that this was all a big show a very big show created by that single single consciousness i have no words to describe that so i just call it totality of consciousness the totality of consciousness that oneness from which everything has originated all of us are not only originating from there we are there this whole show has taken place within that one not outside of it there is nothing outside created consciousness has become conscious of outside within itself and that is why the outside has been created so the whole show is within consciousness and is not outside and this is a it's a great miracle that we can find space and time have the many have so many beautiful worlds created and it's all taking place within a single total consciousness 
and there is nothing outside of it. This discovery comes at the top, at the end. And when we discover it, people have a question. What good is it to discover it? Why should we? Aren't we happy? Whatever we are doing here, are we not happy? Why should we you know, worry about going to these levels of awareness and go and find out the truth? Why? What for? The reason is that this state of being has been created as a different kind of experience. Every level has been created for a different kind of experience than the experience of totality. All that's all part of that one experience by separating different levels of awareness and therefore creating different worlds, as it were. We are having different experiences. The experiences of duality, the experiences of dark and light, the experience of happiness, unhappiness, is generated here. That is why it's generated here. Why do we have this creation at all? To have that experience of duality, pairs of opposites. We are experiencing something which did not exist originally or which is being created within the original so that we can have an experience of pairs of opposites. What has been created here in physical world is a combination of opposites, pain and pleasure, happiness, unhappiness. Everybody here searches for happiness. Unhappiness has been created so we can know happiness. If one is unhappy and something good happens in life, we say, I'm now happy. So it's all relative. If somebody has not seen unhappiness, can never know what happiness here means. Now here we are looking at light and darkness. Supposing there was no darkness. Supposing a certain amount of light is always there, whether we close our eyes, open our eyes, anywhere we go, the light would always be there, we would never have seen it. The word light would not have come into being. It came into being because we could differentiate it from darkness. Every experience that we are having here is generated to give us an experience of <laughs> pairs of opposites. Now, it's all right, it's a good experiment, good way to create polarity, create duality, create double experiences. Now, when you have happiness and unhappiness, and these are both been placed in time, time is a very big factor. We experience happiness in time, in this world. We also experience unhappiness, suffering in time. Now, time is a very wonderful thing. When you are suffering, the time becomes very long, not by the watches, but you are suffering. When you are enjoying and having good time, when you are happy, time becomes very short shakes. Now, here we have been given a time which we don't measure by our experience. We measure with clocks. Interesting with the setting of the sun, rising of the sun, all the calendars are made like that. Time is made based upon something independent from our own subjective experience. So time has been made independent of our subjective experience and we say one hour has passed. Why? I, my clock says one hour. It felt like five minutes because I was having good time and I'm suffering. Like Oscar Wilde says on his essay, on suffering. Suffering is one long moment. When a moment becomes long, you are suffering. If you are happy, it cannot be long. So time is so subjective. Now, because of this nature of time and experience, if we have equal happiness and unhappiness, which we actually have, this world is divided into tangible, intangible means of giving us happiness and unhappiness, and they are equally divided. But since the time frame is such, subjectively, the unhappiness looks much more than the happiness. Happiness passes quickly and unhappiness lasts a long time. Suffering lasts a long time and enjoying lasts less time. 
So therefore, our experience becomes of unhappiness overall. So if this unhappiness was not there, we would not be seeking to get out of it. Why we want to seek something better or different from this is because of the existence of a subjective experience of unhappiness. We all are internally searching for a type of happiness which we can't define because it was the original state in which we were, that blissful state in which we existed. And that tendency to go back to the original state of bliss and total happiness is what is driving us to look for it and that is what makes us a seeker here. This is all well designed. It's all built into the system. It's built into the whole creation that we become unhappy and we want to find something better, more real. If you are not unhappy, you would be happy. Just go on. So if we are just happy and not unhappy, we don't seek anything. We just go on with what is happening. So unhappiness creates the first seeking. And the seeking that takes us to something which should be more happiness giving than giving unhappiness. The world of duality continues, not only in the physical world, it continues in the astral world of sense perceptions. It continues in the world of thoughts. It continues in the causal world. Therefore, to get over this world of duality, we have to go beyond the mind. Now, it is that is a very, very big lid placed upon the creative, creative uh, scene that we see here because all thoughts generate from the causal body, from the mind. And therefore, when we seek, we seek with thoughts. We seeking takes place somewhere other than the mind. But we put it into the mind to express our seeking. Seeking is not always mental. Seeking is spiritual. Seeking is coming from the soul trying to recover its own self. The soul which is life to itself, which we can't see. Mind we can see because we can see thoughts. We can know what we are thinking. But what is making the mind think, we can't see. What is making the mind alive, what is making the mind alive, what is making the body alive, we can't see. Life we can't see. We are living, but we can't see what is making us alive. The soul is not visible to us. Mind is visible. So we try to see that what is the desire of the soul also becomes a language of the mind. We are expressing ourselves spiritually and mentally at all times. The difference is when something happens in, intuitively, something that is mind has not thought of, but comes to us, it's coming from the soul. When we think about something and then decide it's mental, the distinction between intuitive feeling and mental feeling is very clear. Intuitive feeling has no relationship with time. It just comes without time. Mental reasoning always takes time. So any mental thought will always take time. Intuitive feeling will never take time. The distinction is right there. But we cannot see where the intuition comes from. We can see where the mental thought comes from. So that is why we are confined to a world of mind. That is why if intuition says, I want something, the mind says, let me tell you how you can get it. So the mind steps in. Therefore, the mind is the biggest barrier to going anything beyond the mind. The mind cannot take us beyond the mind. And we are constantly using the mind for everything. All our conversations are based on the mind. Our seeking, our speaking, everything is based on the mind. And yet, it's not the mind that is wanting our destination. It's the soul that's wanting. So this is a big problem, that we are covered up by a lid of the mind and we can't go beyond that because the mind is the creator of time and space and we cannot go out of a reality of time and space with the mind. The mind cannot think of a timeless state. There's no way. Nor, but the soul lives in a timeless state. It, it operates from the timeless state. It gives intuitive cut feelings to us from a timeless state. Yet the mind thinks and confirms and confines it to a mental state. Now this is, I'm just explaining how the mind becomes a problem instead of being a help on a spiritual path. 
so that is the difficulty so the mind is a controlling uh, controlling entity for our lives here and if you want to say what is mind if you want to analyze what is mind could we say could we equate something as equal to mind the best thing i could equate with mind is time and space time and space and mind are the same thing if we have no time and space there's no mind if you have time and space that's all mind the mind creates that therefore time and space is the cover we can't go beyond that because we cannot even imagine with the mind anything beyond that so we are in trouble because of that therefore when perfect living masters with their awareness about the mind come into our life here as ordinary human beings like ourselves when they come into our life how do they tackle this problem because we are still trying to think hard how to get out of it we are trying to make plans how to do it we are using the mind to get out of the mind and we can't do it how do they tackle this problem they tackle this problem with something that does not exist in the mind they tackle it with something called love love is not mental love is spiritual love does not come by time when he have an experience of love in this world we never have it doesn't take time to have that experience it comes as sharply as non timely as intuition intuition and love come without time and that is why how these perfect living masters come and take us beyond the mind is not with mental mental be mental methods we are ready for mental methods we are trying to put our seeking of the soul into a mental seeking by making words out of it by making requests out of it making making prayers out of it prayers are all mental everything is mental that we can speak up so they come and touch us with love that pulls the soul by itself at the, at a certain time the love becomes so strong the pull becomes so strong that it pulls us and defies our mental thinking altogether and the mind doubts even can't stop that love from working so mind can keep on doubting and still the love will pull us that's the beauty of their work these perfect living masters come and they pull us with something that exists beyond the mind love and their love is unconditional it is not the kind of love that we have modified with our minds over here we have made our we have made our love which every one of us has because we have a soul if you have a soul you have love soul is love it comes from there so if you have a soul and a love now what has the mind done to it the mind has put its own mental cover upon it like expectations what do you like what will i get for this mind is always doing business transactions if i give you this what do you give me in return and the love as expressed by the mind here is all give and take is i give you this what am i expecting from you if there is no expectation how can there be love not according to the mind the mind is built upon expectations the soul is not connected with expectations at all and that is why the very big difference in the pull that we get from the unconditional love of the perfect living master and the love as we practice it here which is all tainted by these expectations and conditions we our love becomes conditional here because mind loves to have a transaction with conditions and makes love into a transaction conditional transaction here but the master's love comes as unconditional so it's a remarkable experience if you forget all the spiritual talk i give you but just say be in the presence of a perfect living master and see the pull of love and see associate little more see how the mind gets confused what is going on with me why am i having this effect no i maybe i am being duped the mind can say maybe i should call for prayers maybe it's satan devil coming up all kinds of thoughts can come in the mind just because a love which is unconditional which you haven't experienced ordinarily is coming from such a human being 
so the association with the perfect living master itself is good enough the mind still thinks i have to do something to get anything to achieve anything the mind has been built up on that basis that you have to work to achieve something and here we are talking of love which is no achievement or no struggle or no work at all love is not anything like that at all it just comes therefore the mind tries to come in the way and the perfect living masters work our way and they give work to our mind also how meditate follow these rules mind loves it mind loves rules mind loves something to be given to achieve something and therefore they are giving these things all for the mind to keep it busy to keep it not interfering too much in the spiritual journey we have our spiritual journey is taking place because of the pull of a perfect living master who is taking us there and he is taking us in a very orderly way according to how we have been spending time and space over here for so many centuries so such a long time and then he is pulling us at the right time at the right way and the mind is trying to say what will i do what am i supposed to do the master says keep it busy do meditation do these things understand the limitation of meditation no meditation has ever taken anybody above the mind there is no such meditation existing but love and devotion have taken people above the mind because they don't come from the mind so the real secret is love and devotion i have shared these things with you based upon my experiences with a perfect living master azur maharaj baba sawant singh ji's picture you see here it's his message i'm sharing with you he predicted long ago very clearly openly as a human being he spoke up in 1937 and told an american disciple that this is going to be a big shift of true spirituality from the east to the west and we localize in a big way in the united states of america he mentioned this his disciple was julian johnson some of you are familiar with his books i was present when he said this to julian johnson he also wrote letters the same year in 1937 saying the same thing it just so happens that i having been present at that time i was 11 years old when this happened i have never forgotten that event and somehow it so happened that i said since spirituality is going to shift to the west especially united states i should run here and watch what happens so i came to take a ringside seat on this show which i am watching now and sharing with you the beautiful experiences that are possible with the teachings of this master and those are available to all of us through our seeking if you seek the highest you will get the highest thank you very much for listening to my sharing the teachings of great master i'll have a break now i'll come back to you for a little while and if you have any questions i'll take up a few uh, in the afternoon uh, jonathan can uh, you give the question to jonathan and bring it up thank you very much <laughs>